I have uh, come up with uh, what I think is a great irony, or at least a, a, p a pair of ironies um, that I want to talk about uh, in this talk. And the irony have to, has to do with the biopsychosocial model. Um, so I assume everyone in this room is familiar with this. Um, and um, the assumption that we all make about the biopsychosocial model and translation is that at the low level, the bio level, things probably should translate pretty well. Um, where as, as when you go up the biopsychosocial model into the psycho and the social levels, um, you would imagine that translation from animals to humans would become much, much more difficult. Um, I'm going to try to convince you that this is wrong and actually backwards, um, which is very strange. Um, and we'll see at the end if you uh, believe me or not. Um, so suffice it to say, um, we've come a long way from the first uh, guy who uh, took a hard, long look at how pain mechanisms work. Uh, and this, of course, is uh, Descartes' uh, boy. Um, he had it wrong, not completely wrong, but uh, obviously Descartes didn't have it right. Um, we've learned some things from them. So we've learned what's going on in the spinal cord, and we've learned how pain information ascends up to higher levels of the brain. Um, and uh, especially these days, we're now able to go and really take a long, hard look um, in great detail at the microcircuitry uh, inside places like the spinal cord. Um, and of course, with imaging technology, uh, we're now also able to figure out if not how, at least where, uh, pain is processed uh, in the brain, uh, even of humans. And yet, with all this knowledge, and it is impressive, right? Uh, a lot has been learned. Um, but despite that, we are still faced with a major translational problem um, whereby almost nothing ever gets approved. Um, we do, uh, you know, huge drug discovery work. Uh, things go into, uh, you know, preclinical uh, trials uh, in universities and in drug companies. Um, and then we're faced with the so-called valley of death, um, where of all the compounds that look like they should work, uh, only a few of them might work. And at the end of the day, only one in 10,000 gets approved. Um, if you look at the reasons for this translational failure, um, you learn something very interesting and very surprising. So if you look at that pie chart, you see that the number one cause of translational failure, that is to say, a drug looked good enough in animal models that drug company executives were willing to give the green light to spending 10 to $100 million on clinical trials. And then the drug uh, was found out not to be efficacious in humans. That's what lack of efficacy means. It worked in animals. It really looked like it worked, um, but the clinical trial didn't show that it worked in humans and the drug died. Okay? That is obviously a major, major problem. Um, and uh, people uh, <laughs> that I go to conferences with um, have been uh, you know, gnashing their teeth uh, and wringing their arms uh, about why this might be for quite some time now. Um, it strikes me that there's a limited number of explanations for this translational failure that have been proposed. And here they are. On the one side, the preclinical side, a lot of people have talked about the problems with the existing animal models. Um, with their generalizability, uh, possible species differences, and the dependent measures we use in our experiments. And then very recently, there's this thing that's uh, um, going around the world like a virus, suggesting that science doesn't work at all. It's irreproducible. No lab can reproduce another lab's findings. Um, on the other hand, some people have placed the blame for poor translation on clinical trials. Um, that the idea there being that these drugs actually really do work in people. Um, it's just that the clinical trials are increasingly unable to show it. Um, and that's for a number of reasons that I've listed there. So when I look at this list, uh, I've noted to myself that my laboratory has actually worked in a number of these domains and provided evidence that has contributed uh, to how people think about this. And I've uh, uh, highlighted those in blue. And I want to go through them um, in the first part of this talk to tell you what the state of translation is, um, why we're failing, and, and how uh, we can do better and are starting to do better.